Well, good morning, Gateway. How are y'all doing this morning? Y'all have a good spring break? All right, so what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you look around, find one person who you're not sitting with, tell them what you did for spring break this week, or at least give them a big hi. Tell them good morning. And as you do that, I want to let everybody online know that we will be having communion today, and so you can prepare those elements for later on. And as y'all continue to say good morning to each other, I see y'all walking around, I like that. I want to let y'all know that we're having communion at the end of service as well. But we're getting ready to worship, so as you keep going around, let's head on and have everybody stand up if you're not standing up already, so we can be ready to praise and worship God this morning.
inhabits the praise of his people. And if that doesn't make you want to worship, <laughs> then you're broken. Um, let's continue to praise. Praise and worship is a lifestyle. I'm switching places. <laughs> praise and worship is a lifestyle. And there is no one that is more deserving of our adoration and our gratitude and all of our praises. And lifelong, forever, we will sing his praises. We will sing hallelujah to our Lord.
Hosanna in the highest. That's what the people were shouting. Hosanna in the highest. And because of that, we love you. Because you came and gave yourself for us. We thank you, Jesus, for everything that you've done and everything that you came and did for us. That's why we worship you. And we give everything that we have every day of our lives as your mercy and your goodness follow us every day of our life. We thank you. We thank you. Amen. You may be seated. Now this is the time where we get a chance to respond to God with our offerings this morning. Uh, the gospel is based on giving. As Jesus, as God himself gave his only son, you know, for us, for those who love him and have eternal life. So that's just the example that we have from God that every time we come into his courts, we get a chance to give in response to everything that he's done for us. Amen. Uh, there'll be places in the back by the exits where you can give if you brought something, you know, in check, cash. But also you can go into the QR code, click on that, and you'll be able to give through there. Uh, let's pray, and then we'll continue with the service. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this amazing time of worship that we've had. We thank you for everything that you're doing. Now, God, we've come before you in response to what you've done in our lives and to give our offerings and our tithing. We thank you. Bless everything that, that's coming to our household, and as it leaves, we want you to duplicate it and bless abundantly everything that we have given and everything that stays in our household. We thank you, Jesus. I, I, I want to bless, and I want you to bless everybody who can do it and, 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 and the person who cannot. I want you to bless them abundantly so they can be able to give even more. We thank you, Jesus. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, so there, whoa, there you go. And the Lord said, let there be sound now. All right, cool. Good morning. So I don't know about y'all, but um, how many of you have enjoyed the changing of weather in Houston? Okay, good. How many of you has it like wrecked your allergies? Okay, good. I'm in that boat. So that's the reason why I have tea because um, I don't have the meat sweats. I have the tea sweats because I'm drinking hot tea and I'm like, whoo. So that's where I'm at this morning. But good morning, welcome, welcome, welcome. And I'm getting all my stuff set up. So here's what's going on this morning. Is for some of you, um, you're used to this routine of, hey, I'm going to show up to church and then we're going to do our thing. So we're doing that, okay? So we're going to be in God's Word and stuff like that. But we're also having communion. And you're like, wait a minute, it's not the first of the month. That's right. But we're talking about communion this morning. So because we're talking about communion, we are going to have communion this morning. Is everybody okay with that? This means yes. This means no. If you're not, we're still doing it anyway. So Lord be with you. Okay? So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to go ahead and kick off and get started this morning and get jumping into that. I don't know why my phone clock is not popping up, but it's not. Because this helps me stay on track of when I need to start wrapping things up. So let me pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. 
Lord, we pray that as we continue to dive into Mark, Lord, that we just get a nugget of truth this morning, that there's something that we can grasp and hang on to because we know that your word is alive and active. We know that you're at work in us this morning. And for those that are traveling and those that are not with us today and those that are listening and watching online, Lord, that we know that they are part of our biblical community too. And even though they might be all over the country or in different parts of the world, Lord, that, that they're receiving this word this morning. So, Lord, we thank you for this passage of scripture. Lord, we thank you for the time. And use me as a vessel this morning in order to communicate your word clearly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so that way you kind of know we're in the book of Mark. We're going to be in chapter 14 if you need to open up your Bibles. If you need to scan the QR code on the back of your seats in order to figure out where we're at on the app, it'll have some of the notes in there. I'm going to let you know now. There's only like two fill-in-the-blanks, so if you lose them at some point, it's okay. You can ask me later. We can get it to you. Or if you double-click on it later, you can like cheat code it, and then you'll give, you'll give you the answer, if I remember correctly. So going back to that, am I really loud? Because I feel like I'm really loud. No? I'm good? Okay. So, um, how many of you have ever cooked anything in your life? Anybody ever cook anything? All right, so this is going to be a fun story. So, when it comes to just kind of what we're talking about, is sometimes the question of communion is, why do we have communion? Why do we participate in communion? What is the purpose of it? We're going to dig into that this morning. But for those of you that are cooks or people that cook occasionally or every once in a while, or you may have burned a meal or something, there's always been a reason to why you do what you do when it comes to cooking, right? You learn from a grandparent, you learn from a parent, you watch something online, you watch a YouTube video or TikTok, bless you, bless you, and you thought that, hey, maybe I'll learn this thing and we'll figure it out. So a while back, I was listening to a podcast, and a guy was talking to, uh, talking to his audience through this podcast, and they got to the point to where he was saying that he was talking to a friend of his, and he was watching his wife cook a roast, and she was getting the meat and pulling it out, and then she would go to the end of it and cut the end off and just toss it. Perfectly good piece of meat, but she would like, felt like she needed to do that. And then he'd ask, why did you do that? And so she would say, well, because that's what my mom taught me to do. And so then they got to Thanksgiving, and he's like, okay, well, hey, just kind of curious. So he's asking his mother-in-law, same thing. She's like, well, that's what my mom taught me to do. And so grandma's still alive. So then they go up to grandma, like, hey, why did you, why did you do that? And she was like, well, I didn't have a big enough pan. So for generations and generations and generations, you had people cutting off perfectly good pieces of meat. Who knows how many pounds of meat they lost over time, but they lost all that meat because somebody didn't have a big enough pan at some point. And for some of us, when we look at communion, we kind of like, okay, it's this thing where we get bread and wine or grape juice or depending on what you grew up with. And we're like, it's just an event. It's a thing that we do, but there's way more to it than that. And so as we dig into this morning and we look at it and we examine God's word, what we need to be reminded of is when we're in Mark, we're going to start in chapter 17, but a little bit before that is where the guys are getting together, I say the guys, the disciples and Jesus, and they're going to celebrate Passover. And as they're celebrating Passover, we need to remember Passover is part of something, a significant event that took a place in Exodus. We're not going to like go through a whole biblical study of this thing. You could literally do weeks of it, but this, just the kind of quick kind of sum up of it is at some point, the Israelites, the chosen people of God, are under an old covenant where Abraham said, you are my people. And because they are his people, they become enslaved. And at some point, Moses shows up. So if you get into Exodus, you get to the story of Moses. He arrives, he learns, he's educated, and then he's like, hey, you need to let my people go. Because why? Because God's telling him this. And then as the plagues come, multiple and multiple. So if you're looking for drama and you want to read it with your kids, it's awesome. So you get into it, all these plagues, and then they get to the point of what we hear, what we hear of as Passover. And so that way you know, as Christ followers, it's good for us to understand what Passover is and the significance of Passover. But it's also to understand that there's people still of Jewish descent or that are currently Jewish now that still celebrate Passover but they stop there. And so what Jesus is doing at this point is we get to the point of Passover, and you're like, okay, well, what happened? Well, for that evening and that night for the final last shebang that God was going to do is that he told them, go sacrifice a goat and put blood around your doors. And so they're putting blood around the doors. And so as the angel of death would go over, he would pass over their homes. So if they had blood on their doors, which all the Israelites did, their firstborn would survive and live. But the other part that happened was is that people were hearing people screaming and crying and moaning because for 
Pharaoh's, all of Pharaoh's people, they lost a child. And this Passover is a glorious thing in one part, but it's also a sad part in the other end because it's like, if they would have just listened to what God was telling them through Moses, then they would have gone through this tra tragedy. But at the same time, too, the gratefulness of understanding and then from there on all the way, talking about, talking about a few thousand years to this point to where we're going to read now, they're, gonna, they're still celebrating it. And even till today, there's people that celebrate Passover now. But the cool thing is, is that something takes place as we get into that. So we're going to start off with our main point. It's going to be our first slide that's going to pop up. And so our main point for today is that communion is a remi reminds us of Christ's new covenant. Okay, we talked about the old covenant, but now we're talking about a new covenant that's to come. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So in Mark chapter 14, verses 17 through 21. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up there. It says... Well, I knew I was missing something, my glasses. So in verse 17, it says, And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at the table, you got to remember, not in regular tables like what we have, like shorter tables or like chilling with a pillow, right? Okay? So as they were reclining at the tables and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. One who is eating with me. And you're like, wait a minute. I thought they were celebrating Passover. They are. But this is part of the process. Because Jesus already knew that somebody was going to betray him. So verse 19, they began to be sorrowful. The disciples were saddened by it, right? And to say to him, to say to him one after another, is it I? So imagine you're sitting at a table with Jesus. And then you find out, he's like, hey, one of you is going to betray me. One of you is going to leave me. One of you is going to, you know, stab me in the back, pretty much, who's going to turn on me. And they're all like, is it I, is it I, is it I? And you can only imagine being at the table. And he said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. So imagine being Judas in that moment. And you're like, your bread is in there? Like, whoa, that's me? I'm the guy? Try it at lunch. If you decide at some point, at some point this week, if you're going to go eat you know, chips and salsa, and you're going to go get fajitas or something like that, and you're just jokingly with your kids, and as they're dipping, it's like, one of you, the one that's dipping in the queso right now is going to betray me. And they'll be like, what? One of you is going to sin today, and it's the one with the chip in the queso. Oh, my gosh. But verse 21 it says, for the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not even been born. And that's kind of the sad part about it. It's like Judas is going to betray Jesus and he's basically telling him like, man, it would have been better if you hadn't been born because you're going to betray me. But the other thing too is it had to have happened in order to fulfill what Jesus already knew that he was going to fulfill when it came to the new covenant. So our first fill in the blank is going to be Jesus was loving Judas and also aware of what he was going to do. It's one of those things that we kind of wrestle with when it comes to life, right? We can love, we can love somebody, but then sometimes, eh, I don't know if I really trust them or if I'm going to, you know, or if I'm upset with them or frustrated with them at that moment, right? So it's one of those things where Jesus is loving him, and it's like, well, how do we know that? 1 John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave... His only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. From those of us that are watching online or those of us that arrive this morning, at some point we've made a decision that we believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he died on the cross for our sins, and we put our faith and our trust in him. But guess what? We're all in the same boat. At some point, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. So for all of us, we've all been in that position where we've betrayed Ju Jesus at some point. We've all been in the position of Judas where we've all done that. Whether it's been by sin, whether it's been intentional, whether it's been using blasphemous terms in order to describe God. Even at some point as a non-believer. But then there's a shift. So as we get into Mark 14, uh, verse 22, there's a change. So he's calling Judas out, but then he shifts gears. And so as he's doing that in verse 22, 
He says, and as they were eating, he took the bread and after blessing it and gave it to them and said, take this is my body. Take this is my body. Now, here's the thing. So for some people, I've had this question from students before and even college students and even adults, okay? So if at any point somebody's asking you when you're taking communion and as you hear about it, are you a cannibal? You're not a cannibal, okay? We're not physically going and murdering Jesus and eating his body. It is the symbolism of his strength and his authority, right? If we're taking the word of God, are we physically ripping out pages of the Bible and eating it? No. So sometimes we kind of get that in our head where it's like, well, I don't know if I really want to do that because I'm going to be taking in, like, the body and then we're drinking blood? Like, are we vampires? Like, what's going on? Like, no. It's a reminder. It is a constant reminder of who Christ is, the authority of who he is, and the strength that he provides. We can, we can try to live lives on our own, but if we've been a Christian for a number of years or for a significant period of time, how many of us we say, I do very well when I live life on my own without spending time with Jesus. How many of y'all are doing pretty good with that? Okay, how many of you are like, I'm a train wreck if I don't spend time in prayer and spend time with the Lord? Okay, I'm in the same boat with you. Because why? We're all human beings. We can't do everything on our own. That is the reason why we needed a savior. And we can try to do it on our own. And then we're like, how did my week fall apart? Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. But it's what happens, right? It happens. So as we get into Mark 14, 23, uh, verses 23 and 24, so he goes back, he talks about his body, it's being broken. Why is it broken? His body is broken because of what, his death on the cross, because he's gonna be beaten. He's telling this as, as in a way, the foreknowledge of, of him being God in the flesh, coming from heaven to earth to dwell, dwell among us, and as he's saying this, he's also letting us know, like his crucifixion, death, is not the prettiest thing in the world. Like if we think of it, if you've seen the passion of the Christ, it's like that's just a glimmer of what somebody can actually produce of what he went through. But his body is being broken. Why? Because he's the sacrificial lamb. Like I talked about in Passover, you would get a perfect, unblemished lamb and sacrifice it. And then have to use it as a burnt offering and then also with his blood. It's the same thing with Christ. He's doing the exact same thing. So in uh, verse 23, Mark 14, verse 23. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they drank, uh, and they all drank of it. Verse 24. And he said to them, this is my blood of the of the covenant, which is, a, which is poured out for many. In Luke chapter 22, verses 19 through 20, it makes reference to the new covenant, that is our other fill in the blank, is making reference to a new covenant. Well, because the old is gone and the new is in. So in, in Hebrews uh, chapter eight, verse 13, it says, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. So the first one that people are still celebrating is gone. It is gone. No more. It is moved. It's done. Why? And speaking of the new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is already to vanish away. And why? Because Jesus is gonna fulfill the covenant of what's gonna take place. And the cool part about it is the fact that we get to be a part of it. The cool part about the new covenant is not only do we get to be a part of it, but then we also get to be a part of his kingdom because he goes from selecting a people in the old covenant, Abraham, I picked you, but you are my people. In the new covenant, it's that Christ died on the cross for all of our sins, and we personally have to make a choice on whether we're gonna accept it or not. And that's the thing is for some of us, we'll say, hey, God intervened in such a way that I really don't feel like I had a choice. I am one of those when I came to know Christ. And that's where people tend to kind of struggle with it a little bit. But for some of you, it's like, hey, I heard a message when I was a kid and then I made a decision to go down and pray and receive Christ. Or I made it, or I was calling out to God and calling out to him and I felt his presence and he 
And ever since then, I've been a follower of Jesus. However that takes place, not to get bogged down in the weeds of it, but at some point, it's understanding the new covenant that's coming, and that's with the shedding of his blood. So the breaking of his body, the shedding of his blood. So then in verse 14, uh, excuse me, in Mark 14, verse 25, it says, truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it in the new kingdom of God. Why? Because he will have resurrected and fulfilled what he was gonna do in the new covenant. So you're like, okay, great. Breaking body, drinking of blood, Jesus is gonna re- resurrect. That should be something that we actually get excited about. That should be something that we actually have hope in. It's the fact that our Savior is a risen Lord and we get to be a part of what he's called us to do. Not because we're great and wonderful people, not because we're the best people in the world or I'm a good person, but it's because we've been saved by grace through faith. We get to celebrate, we as Gateway Community Church, we celebrate two sacraments. Sacraments are things that are given to us by grace, unmerited favor, right? So it's baptism, we saw that in the video, and then the other one is communion. But what does Paul write when it comes to, first, in 1 first Corinthians chapter 11, and we're gonna read through verses 27 through 34. And this is something that we really need to think about whenever we're gonna take communion. It's because he's teaching the church in Corinth, hey, how, this is how you should go about it. So in verse 27, it says, whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. And you're like, whoa, wait a minute, okay, I don't wanna be in, a, in the doghouse with the Lord. But verse 28, it says, let a person examine himself. So what does it mean to examine ourselves? It means when we actually have this time of prayer, when Randy comes up and as he's gonna lead us in communion, when we have that time, it's got, like, God, what is it in my heart? What are the things that I'm holding on to? What is the thing that I'm not willing to let go? Because for all of us, we have something. It's a sin, it's baggage, it's anxiety, it's fear, it's whatever it may be. For some of us, we're holding on to everything and we're like clinging on to it like, okay, you let everything go and I'm just gonna hold on to this. But It's not really that big of a deal. I just carry around my burdens with me. It's fine. I can go ahead and be a part of this. But it's like, no. If we want true freedom, we actually have to let it go. And we have to give it to God. And that's probably the hardest thing that we struggle with. I was telling Randy and the guys uh, that prayed with me this morning before I got ready to preach, and I was telling them a few years back, it was interesting because when he came to communion, um, I remember I was like, I'm not, I'm not fit or ready to, ser- uh, to serve communion to people, like to facilitate it. Because I was really struggling that week. But I was not struggling because of a sin issue. I was struggling because of an insecurity issue. And that's tough, because in that moment I was like, I was asked to participate in offering communion and participating in it, but there was part of me that was like, no, I can't. And then like, so this whole back and forth that I'm wrestling with God is like, well, why can't you? And I'm like, well, I don't know, I don't think I'm good enough. He's like, you're not good enough. (laughs) I'm not. But here's the thing though, it's the grace that I received by grace through faith. And that's the part that I was not remembering. Because sometimes the enemy, like we just finished in our last series, don't let the enemy have a seat at your table, is telling us you're not worthy. You're not. But Jesus is. He's glorified us in being obedient to what he's called us to do. And sometimes it's just laying our cards down and like, you know what, I'm holding on to a few. I just need to lay them all down. And once I do that and let it go, then it's like, then what else does Satan have to throw at me? He can do all kinds of things, but the thing is, is my freedom is my freedom because of not of who I am, but because of who Christ is. And so as we go back and we're going through, as we go back through this, then as we examine our hearts, so going back to verse 28, so so let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning, right, knowing what's right and what's wrong through it, the body eats and drinks Judgment on himself. Verse 30, that is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Now, this is a controversial verse, and I knew when I was gonna bring it up, people were like, wait a minute, so when I got sick, I'm not saying that. My thing is, is it's where you're examining yourself, okay? 
when you're examining yourself, I will say an example for me. How many of us have been through burnout before? How many of you were in burnout because you didn't let something go? I'm in the same boat. So when I was exhausted, like, why am I keep getting sick? I keep having all these sinus things again. All this other stuff's happening. He's like, well, guess what? Because I wasn't willing to let it go. But then when we finally do, it's like, oh, my gosh, the weight's been lifted. It's like, why didn't I do this sooner? And God's like, uh, Jesus died on the cross for you. I already told you that. Like, why didn't you just give it to him? But sometimes we're stubborn human beings, right? It's the reason why God calls us sheep. That's not in my notes. That's just a rolling thing. Verse 31. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. Not if we're like beating ourselves up about it, but if we're truly examining ourselves like, okay, God, I'm laying it all down to you. Verse 32, but when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that, bless you, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. And then verse 33, so then, my brothers, when we come together to eat, wait for one another. Verse 34, if anyone is hungry, let him eat, bless you, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment, and that other things I will give directions when I come. And so that's where he starts wrapping things up. So my thing is, is as we're looking at communion this morning, the question is, is there anything that you're hanging on to that you're not willing to let go? Just think about it. Is there anything that you're hanging on to that you haven't been willing to let go? Because I'm gonna tell you, the one thing that I find interesting about the candle being in the middle of the room is that our, in order for our light to shine as followers of Christ, is that sometimes we're the ones that are blocking our own light. God's already sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within us. If you're a follower of Christ, the Holy Spirit already dwells within you. But there's a part where for some of us, it's kind of like we put little boxes of blinders in front of it. I'm not gonna fall, trust me, I'm gonna be okay. So, I saw people's eyes go like that. Um, but we kind of put boxes and blinders in front of it, and that's really... Just us like, okay, I'm gonna hang on to this, I'm gonna hold on to this, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna, and it's like, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna. How's it working, working, working? Like, I say that over and over, and you're gonna hear me harp on that like for the rest of my career when it comes to Jesus, but that's my thing, is that in order for our light to shine, is that we really have to truly surrender and give everything to God in order for our light to shine, for him to work in and through us. And if that means this morning that whatever burden or whatever sin or whatever thing that you're hanging on to that you need to let go, you need to empty yourself out and confess it, give it to the Lord. That way you can even have peace and joy and allow the fruit of the Spirit to work and move within you as you are pursuing your relationship with Christ. And that's something that we tend to forget about so when it comes to communion, yes, we are celebrating the new covenant that we are blessed with, with Christ dying on the cross and resurrecting, and us being able to establish a relationship with him. Because, not because of what we've done, but as we receive communion, as we receive it, it's because it's been given to us by grace. By grace. You can't earn it, you don't deserve it. But he gave it to us anyways. And even for Judas and Peter that are sitting with Jesus, even in the midst of having that meal with them at Passover, he still had them participate in communion knowing what they were going to do. Something to think about. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this morning. Lord, we just pray that even just as we are about to take communion this morning, Lord, that we come to you with humble hearts. Lord, that if, even as we have time to reflect and just even look into ourselves, Lord, that we begin to start examining ourselves right now. Lord, those that are watching online or those that are driving, Lord, that they don't close their eyes and have a Jesus take the wheel moment, but Lord, that they will self-examine while they're where they're at as they participate in communion. And Lord, as the servers and, and other team members start begin to come up, Lord, that you will continue to watch over us and guide us and direct us. Lord, that we can walk out of here filled with your joy and your peace because we're so grateful of what we get to be a part of. So Lord, we just thank you, we love you, and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Roland. It is a privilege 
to receive the gift of the sacrament of Holy Communion. And um, I've been in settings where people say, well, aren't you only supposed to do it once a month? Or can you do it more than once? And if this is grace, if this is a symbol of God's grace, don't you want to receive? Don't you want to be reminded of all God has done for us? And so the invitation is, as Roland mentioned, very simple. If you're seeking after Christ, you're welcome to come. You do not have to be a part of our, our church, our congregation, our denomination, any of that, because this is the Lord's table. He did this for all of us, not just for Gateway Church. And therefore, we offer it to all who would receive. And we invite you to do that. But to begin with, as Roland also reminded us, we first examine ourselves. So I'm going to begin a prayer of confession. And uh, then I'll pause and allow each of us to talk to God privately ourselves and to just lay down whatever we need to lay down personally. Uh, whatever it is that we've been holding on for for too long, uh, knowing that God, God already knows what it is, and he's hoping we will lay it down. So let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you so much for your son Jesus Christ and all that he has done for us that we certainly have not deserved, can never earn. But he came while we were yet sinners, you sent him before we got our acts together. It means that sin, the reality of sin in our lives is not something that keeps us from experiencing you, but unconfessed sin does work against us and block us. And so we pray, Father, that you would hear us as we confess, each one of us, um, those sins that that we need to share with you now, this morning. Hear us now. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I'm, as I, I like to remind us all, I'm not saying that you nor certainly I had enough time to confess everything we needed to confess. Confession should be a part of the Christian's daily life. But having done that, here is good news from Scripture, from God's own word. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as I hear these words myself, I say them to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins, my sins, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And so we come together with Jesus on that last night when he was with his friends and he took the bread and he broke it and he said this is my body broken for you receive this in remembrance of me and then at the end of the meal he took the cup and passed it among his friends and he said drink from this all of you for this is my blood of a new covenant a new kind of relationship that is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. And so, Father, we come this morning and we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and juice and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, the symbol of all that he did for us, what he did for us on the cross, what he did for us in his resurrection, that we might have new life
through him, by your love, through the power of your spirit. We thank you for this gift that we don't deserve, we can't earn. But we don't simply thank you for receiving it. We receive it for nourishment so that we can then be about your work, your kingdom work in the lives of those around us. Father, help us to realize it's not simply for us, but it's for us for the world. You don't call us to just be recipients, but ones who are agents of your love and grace. And so as we receive, may we be sure then to give, to give out of the overflow of all that you have given to us so that we, with you, can join in the work of Jesus, in the work for the Lord, for this world, for our family, our friends, those around us, for whomever you allow us to cross paths with. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So now I want to invite those who will be serving to come forward. Um, and I will serve them so that they can then serve you. And as they're serving each other, I'll give some directions to you as well. Christy, the body of Christ. David, the body of Christ for you. His blood shed for you and for me, the forgiveness of our sins and the sins of the world. And so we will set up three stations across the front and one in the back. Uh, feel free to go where is most convenient, but if you're coming forward, we have, uh, we typically have a slide that shows kind of your movement down the aisles. Um, we may not have it this morning. There it is. Just to help with the flow a little bit. Uh, these three stations will all be down front. There'll be one in the back center that will have gluten-free bread if that is something that you need or that's important to you. As well, we have two stations uh, by this camera and by our sound area that has uh, prepackaged bread and juice. Uh, if you would prefer to use that method to receive, then you're welcome to go and pick those up and receive them. Now, once you have partaken of this gift, um, we invite you to, to pray. Uh, if you come forward and you would like to pray uh, along our platform where it becomes in essence and symbol a, a prayer rail, uh, you can do that or return to your seat. Um, and we'll dismiss this, the service in just a few moments after everybody has been served. If one line is much shorter than another, feel free to go to that line. And as always, I'd like to remind you that um, children are welcome. This is what God's family does. He has offered this invitation to us all to come and receive. So won't you come as you feel led and ready?
before we're dismissed today, I wanted to direct your attention to a few announcements. And so you can find those in the online bulletin. You can get to it through the QR code that's around you or it's also in the Gateway app. But a big event that we have coming up here is in a couple of weeks, and that is our Easter egg hunt. So that's gonna be a great opportunity for you to invite the community up here a Gateway. It's going to be a fun time where we're going to be hunting Easter eggs for all the little ones. So if you know of young families who are looking for a place to have a great event and connect with others, or it may be a way for you to talk to your neighbors that you may be a little bit scared to talk to, but it's a great invite tool to bring them up here. And who knows what the spiritual conversations can be after that. And if you'd like to serve for that event, you can look on the app and it'll tell you different ways that you can serve for the Easter egg hunt. And if you're new here, we're glad that you've come a gateway. It's a great place where we really try to value relationships. So if you could, there's a connect card that you can fill out that lets us know more about you so we can contact you. Or you can go right outside those doors at the end of service to the say hello area to meet a few friends, get a free gift, and also speak with Pastor Randy. Or next week, if you're new here, you've been kind of seeing, okay, is Gateway the place for me? We invite you to an event called Starting Point. We're gonna have free barbecue, it's a place to meet staff, and for you to connect with others and learn more about Gateway in general. So we invite you to come next week, it's after second service at 1215. But finally, we're gonna have our prayer partners come forward because as we have gone through the message and through the service, if you feel like there's something on your heart that you'd like to be prayed with or something to pray over, our prayer team is here for you, or if that's a big step, you can also fill out a prayer request online as we have a team of people who love praying for you throughout the week. But as Roland was talking about, it's so great that the new covenant is here. So whatever you were thinking about that you need to work on and that you prayed about during communion, we encourage you to work on that during the week as well. And it's a great day here at Gateway. Welcome to your journey. Y'all have a good week.